We'll go. I want to thank you all for coming. Obviously, Facebook does work sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there have been times where I've done it and nothing. fell over with nothing. So, do appreciate it. Okay. And if you haven't, uh, if you could please sign in. Uh, I'd appreciate it uh, using your email address this way. If there's any information that you would like sent to you from this meeting, I'll have it. I can send it out to you. Uh, from there if, if you don't have it uh, delivered to you yet. Okay. All right, um, I'll get it started now. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm Paul Rose, I'm the uh, Council at Large. I'm the Chairman of the uh, Emerging Technologies Committee. Uh, John Coin, Council President. Jim Shields, Ward Ford. Okay, Dennis. Dennis Hamill, Mayor. And Colleen. Colleen Sledek, County Commissioner. Okay, and Dave, do you want to introduce your group? Uh, sure. So um, we have from Lit Communities, we'll talk a little bit more about them later, uh, Lauren Bender and Ben Ramirez. And for those who don't know me, I'm Dave Corrado from the County Fiber Network. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, again, thank you all for attending. I hope the information uh, that's shared here this evening will show the residents uh, what work is being done to increase the competition and improve internet service to the residents. A special thank you to the mayor for his uh, help in making sure that the network doesn't stop in the townships. Uh, he's the one who started getting the word out about the fiber network and the need to take the survey, and that'll be something we'll discuss in a little bit. Uh, uh, thanks to Dave for coordinating the organizations uh, from LIT to be here this evening and uh, to show us what they got and what we can potentially have here. So I'm going to shut up and I'll leave it up to you guys. Start again? Sure. Um, Dave and I have been touring uh, the county and we're so glad to be here. Um, we are looking to bring our fiber ring, um, fiber to the home project now, not just to be for the businesses and the industries in Medina County, but actually go to the home. Our most important goal in this project is to give our residents choice. Um, we have a lot of mini monopolies throughout the county. Um, some people like the company they have, some people are dissatisfied, but the important thing, whether you like the company you're with or not, is that you will now, as this fiber to the home project comes, will give you choice. Choice not only often gives you a better price with better options, but it also gives you better customer service because the company that you're with, you know, has to provide great customer service if they know that there's another option out there. So Dave is the more technical side of it. I kind of just op usually open up with that little beginning, so I'm going to let Dave go ahead now. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. So we are doing this little dog and pony as we're going throughout the county. I think we have the transitions done pretty well by now. Um, and I'll introduce Lyft Communities in just a little bit. So um, for those who don't know about Medina County Fiber, what's different about it is um, think of a railroad track. And on this railroad track, we have trains. And each one of those trains is a telecommunications provider. And each one of those train cars is a service. It's voice, it's internet, it's data center. So you can go into an area as a carrier, and you can string fiber up in telephone poles, and you can put it underground, and do all that type of stuff and invest a lot of money. So a lot of times, you won't go into certain areas based on what you believe to be a viable network or not. So Medina County said, well, what if everybody shared the same railroad track and the trains would just pay us for moving along the track? We'll build the track and the carriers, you bring all your services. And the reason for this was to increase competition, lower prices, and the big thing, economic development, right? People are going to want to work and live in places where utilities, and I use the word utility for fiber services because it is most definitely today as important as water and electricity and gas, roads, airports, etc. Many, many historians are calling this the era of fiber, just like we had um, the Industrial Revolution, we had the Renaissance, that's what they believe this time frame for the past five years, the next five to ten years will be, uh, because it is changing the infrastructure of, of our country. So we have taken that model 
and we have adapted it to residential. Take that same railroad track, use the existing railroad track that Medina County Fiber has built, and extend that into the residence, into the neighborhoods, utilizing a partner, which would be the communities, as we'll talk about in a few minutes. Allow people to have multiple choices. Now, getting everything up and running will be just a single carrier to begin. But within a couple of years, we'll have multiple carriers. And oh, by the way, your existing cable providers are allowed to jump on the fiber. We're opening this up to Armstrong and Spectrum and WOW and anybody else. Just like the commercial network um, is also open to all of them, okay? So, and the reason we do that is because, again, it's a community project. And speaking of community, the real neat piece is that once the networks are up and running in the geographies, townships, cities, villages, those particular municipalities will have the option of purchasing that network, bonding it, selling bonds to pay for that. So they'll know the exact revenue that's coming off of it. They'll know what the bond payment will be. Preferably, they'll match, and there won't be any cost. And then once those bonds are paid off, your local community now has extra dollars. So the money you pay to your utility can be used to come back to you in your own community. Or the county may go, and it may buy the whole thing, you know, but there are these options that are different than a commercial carrier choosing one area, building everything on their own, and offering only their services. In the six years, roughly, that I've been in this role, we've seen prices drop about 30% from the competitors in the area. We've gone from one to two fiber providers to about five that have their own fiber, and then we bring in 13 carriers on the Medina County Fiber Network. So now you have a choice, you know, of 16, 17 carriers over high-speed fiber in just the past six years. So, you know, you take that municipal network and, and you extrapolate it out to 20 years on what it can do. And an interesting, and I won't bore you with all statistics, but one is 72% of the $300 million or so of economic development that has occurred in Medina County over the past five years or so, 72% of that are by companies that are on the fiber network. And we see numbers like 53% of all jobs grown and or retained, people who use the fiber network. And I can go down and down the list, and you would be amazed on how that correlates. Because the companies don't have to leave. They can, we can connect them anywhere across the world. And that's what we're going to be doing with this network where it's not just gonna be television and voice and internet, it's going to be telehealth, the ability to reduce healthcare costs by doing some type of diagnostics at your home. We have a carrier who has those abilities. And then we have other things like smart homes, right? The ability to manage your house. And oh, by the way, those types of, of uh, item solutions over fiber increases the value of your house three to 4%. Uh, maybe be higher depending on where you're at, but a high-speed fiber right away automatically increases the value of whether it's a home or whether it's a commercial uh, commercial building. So you're raising, if you will, the entire gross domestic product of your community and you keep the money local. And again, it's open to, to all the carriers, okay? Um, we're gonna hold questions to the last, if that's okay, just so you can get all the info because it sort of plays together. And I'm gonna introduce Lauren Bender to talk a little bit about lit communities. Go ahead. I just wanted to add one more thing um, in your explanation was excellent. I, I do wanna stress, because we did have the question in other communities, this project is not going to cost the city and the townships any money. The project will be borne by you know private equity partners and it will not be uh, a cost to the taxpayer either. So in no way will the taxpayers be paying for this project or the individual uh, political entities paying for this project. So I, I, I did want to stress that because that was a concern at a couple of the places that we went to. Very good point. All right, so I'll let Lauren talk about this and talk about the roles of all the partners because we're one piece of the pie and there are many pieces for putting something together like this because again, we're all working together 
with the community stakeholders as a project for the community. We're not doing this for a commercial personal gain. So it's a little different as far as the setup goes. And that's where Lit Communities pulls all those pieces together. So Lauren, why don't you go over there? Yeah. Hi everybody, I'm Lauren, nice to meet you. Um, and we'll just go ahead and get started here. That's, I realize a little small, but I'll just gonna give you a, a background on uh, who Lit Communities is, um, how we came about. Um, so we've been working in this industry um, collectively for about 15 years, um, where we were more on the engineering side of these big networks for the big carriers like uh, your Comcast and your CenturyLinks uh, of the world. Um, we realized that wasn't something we were very passionate about, but uh, you know it, it got us all started in this industry. Um, so then we kind of moved on and we went. Let me see. I think I have another slide actually. So we started with the AT&T's of the world. The next thing that I was going to say is we um, Google Fiber kind of came about. They shook up the industry. Um, they were a company that was never in telecom before, um, but they wanted to try to deliver services. Um, they ended up not doing a very good job of that. Um, I'm sure, I don't know if you've heard the horror stories of some of the communities that they went into, but um, it took them, they made millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of mistakes um, because they didn't know what they were simply doing. Um, so then they went and did, we, we helped engineer the Huntsville Utilities Project in Huntsville, Alabama. It was the first municipal network um, that we were a part of. And it was basically a model where the community, um, they own their own electric utility, and they built fiber basically all the way to the curb, almost to your home. But then it was Google's job to build from the curb to the house. So it's very similar to the model that we're proposing, which we call an open application model, which is what Dave and Mr. Swedek were talking about earlier, where it's one pipe all the way from one central location all the way out to your home. And anybody um, is, is able to offer the services across that network, not just uh, one provider that would normally own that infrastructure. Um, so it wasn't, the Huntsville model wasn't quite an open application model because Google did own that drop they were the only service that was offered uh, on that network. Um, so we, you know, we saw this, this model kind of changing form. Um, we were introduced to the open application model um, through our partners in Sweden. Uh, that entire country is basically an open application model. Um, and we were like, well, we're seeing all these small towns being left behind. You know, at and is not going there, Comcast isn't going there people are left with satellite or one option or dial up even still. We're like, we, we can't let this happen. Our country is literally falling behind, uh, way far behind in the technology era. Um, so we created our Geek City program in, in 2015. It was with our former company where we really started out just consulting um, smaller communities um, and explaining to them, you know, mostly education, explaining to them what their options were um, outside of just being left behind. Um, and then in 2019, obviously that is this year, so we are we are new. Um, but like I said, our, our history is um, kind of speaks for itself. Um, we're we're not new to the industry. We're not new to this model. Um, uh, we yeah we created lit communities um, back in April of this year. Um, so we're very excited to be in your community um, building this uh, open application model. So these are the, the founders, um, Ben's over here, um, I'm myself obviously, and you guys, some of you might have seen the face on the far right before. Um, he's been, he did the, the kickoff meeting that would happen back in, um, was it May, April? April. April, um, for this, this network. Um, uh, unfortunately, he couldn't be here today, but he's our CEO, I'm the COO, and Ben is our CMO. going to briefly go through kind of our, our process. Um, so first of all, what we do when we go into a community is we like to do a, a market assessment uh, a process, which basically we assess the market for um, three things, which is uh, take rate. So what is what are the residents of the community, what are they likely to take a service that we're going to offer? Um, we also analyze the cost to build in that market. Um, these, these networks are not cheap. Um, they cost millions of dollars to build. So 
Uh, that's something that we obviously need to know uh, to build a financial model. And then combine those those two numbers combined, we can basically build a return on investment. When when are the investors going to see their return on their dollar? Basically, uh, that's that's the thing that everybody wants to see. Um, so that's step number one. Um, we have essentially completed that in the four cities that we are starting the Medina Fiber Project off in, which are Seville, Lodi, Westfield Center, and Gilbert Township. Um, then you go into design and engineering. Uh, basically, you know, we say, hey, this market looks good. Uh, we're going into it. We've got financing. Uh, we're going to design and engineer it. Um, and then, obviously, from there, construction, operations, and maintenance, and then expansion basically is um, things that aren't even you know, real today. What, what is the next big thing? You know, people keep talking about 5G. That's a buzzword right now. It takes more fiber to, to build a 5G network than fiber that exists in the world right now. So, um, but anyway, that's a kind of high, uh, high level overview of our process. Um, more high level overview of our, of our process. Um, Basically, it breaks down the market assessment process, which is something that we would want to come in to your city and do. Um, we we have um, you know idea of the demographics, um, and you all have probably participated in the survey that's out there uh, currently going on. So that's um, you know part of the market assessment process. Like I said, is um, those those take rates. You know who wants the service, where do they want it, uh, and when do they want it. Um, so if you go to medinafiber.com, if you haven't taken the survey, I encourage you to, to take that survey. It's medinafiber.com. Um, you know, tell us that you want it. Um, because currently we're only uh, working on the phase one of the project right now. Um, but we, we want to expand this network to the residents uh, of all of Medina County. Um, yes, Can I say one thing about the survey, too, at another community? We want to stress that the survey does not lock you into anything. It not. just shows us that you're interested so there is no monetary uh, commitment to do the survey it just shows us how many people on your street are really interested and it encourages us to get there quicker yeah from a nerdy like GIS pers uh, engineering perspective you know it's going to put points on a map and show this percentage of people want it here um, that's what I like to see <laughs> <laughs> so part of the market assessment process is doing a basically a high level design um, that slide that picture on the, the left kind of shows we've you know designed out to our these these homes in this area and it's going to cost uh, approximately what does that say uh, about seventy sixty thousand dollars to um, build just to those those group of homes um, that's what I was talking about earlier when we we're trying to get that high level financial model of um, what it's going to cost to build an entire market. So we combine that with the, the survey data, which is here. Um, it doesn't quite look like this when you guys will go to MedinaFiber.com, um, but it's very similar. Um, but you, you know, you can see you just input um, your information. There's a few more questions on the current survey out there, um, but it'll pinpoint you right on, on the map where, where you're supposed to be. Uh, and then this is an example of kind of what comes out of that market assessment. Um, we put together a very, very detailed financial model um, to bring to our investors um, because otherwise they're going to look at us like we're crazy and have no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> um, and then on the right is more of just a, a high level kind of, um, I guess, in, in more layman's terms for those investors because a lot of the investors. They don't have an, an idea of what the uh, telecom really is, the industry. You know, they're the money guys, um, so that helps a lot. And then this is a diagram of more of our overall process that you saw earlier, kind of the steps that are included in, in, in each of the swim lanes. Um, so right now, we're in that demand aggregation study piece for the city of Medina. That's where we exist right now for the city of Medina. And as far as um, phase one of the project that I mentioned earlier in the four lower cities in the county, um, or in that detailed design engineering kind of phase. Now, be said right here. Um, so like I said, 
those are the four towns, four cities uh, in phase one. Um, they are in what we call sign-up phase. So they've done their surveys, they've you know, showed that they're interested. Um, we have done the financial models for those cities. Um, we're about to start the detailed in, uh, design, um, but they're in that, that sign-up phase, which uh, Commissioner Sweatick was saying, you know, the, the survey is just interest, but the sign-up is different, it's a separate piece. Um, we would, add, you know, it, at that time, you would be committing to signing up uh, for that service. You kind of, you know, you've been educated, you know what's coming to your house, um, you know, construction's going to start soon, things like that. Um, you know, uh, and so that's kind of what you see in phase two. The market assessment ongoing, like I said, survey, take it. And then um, we're actively um, doing, creating that financial plan um, as we're getting, you know, uh, survey results, uh, as we're doing uh, designs uh, to understand how much it's going to cost to build, to combine those two. So, and then this more gets into the the model that you know <coughs> that we are wanting to turn this whole country into. To be, you know, that might be a big dream, um, might take a few years, but it's the way we see it needs to go. Um, as Dave and Commissioner Swag were saying earlier, you know the. We call them like the, the tier one providers, uh, at and the Comcast of the world, the big boys. They kind of cherry pick and, um, you know, they're beholden to their stakeholders. Uh, they are private companies that they have to, you know, make margins, um, make numbers. And makes makes sense to go to the densest, you know, uh, densest, maybe more wealthy communities. Um, nothing against them. They kind of, they have to do that. but. What happens to communities like Madani County? You know who goes there. <coughs> so, um, open application makes it available for anybody to write our networks. Any type of service. Um, you, we're we're going to be offering a, like smart um, home uh, services, security services for your homes, um, telehealth, as Dave said, um, and then obviously internet, TV, and, and voice will all be available as well. Um, Yeah, this is just an example of the, the different services. I'm going to step in my head, ahead of myself on, uh, on the slides here. But yeah, that, may, that last one that just popped up, what else? You know, fiber uh, is a piece of infra infrastructure that will go in the ground and will stay in the ground and it will not be ripped up. It's the electronics on the very ends of that that are going to be changed out throughout the years. That's the stuff that will, will be new and, up and, and flashier electronics, right? Your speeds will go higher. But that, that fiber that's in the ground, that'll last 70 years. Um, so there'll be new services that come out, you know, two, three, four, five, 20 years from now, that'll all be able to ride across this infrastructure um, and you won't have to change it. I kind of talked about the, the providers already. Uh, but that last one though is, is kind of a different one. Um, you know, as, as Dave was saying, um, after this, this network's up and running it'll, and, and making revenue, you know, the city or the county uh, will have the option to bond it and buy it back uh, if, if that's something that they want to do. And at that point, you know, um, if, if it's something where you want to lease dark fibers, um, that those are very basically um, kind of like a precious stone, right? Fiber is uh, the number one like new piece of infrastructure that everybody wants to own right now. So if you can lease that to other people, um, that's another way to generate revenue, not just internet, voice, telehealth, and smart home apps. Um, yeah, another piece of revenue. So this is an example of kind of a mock-up of what, what you might see um, when you do eventually go select your services. Think of um, our platform as a uh, like the, the the app store on your phone. Um, when you're going to pick out new apps that you want, you know you'll have options for your internet, your telehealth, smart home, all the above. Um, and then within those, you'll see the different the different options that exist. Uh, iFiber will be the first um, internet service provider on uh, this network. Um, 
So that 100-100 uh, that package you're seeing at the very top there for $49.99 a month uh, will be the, the price. And um, let me take a minute to explain the, does everybody know what you get for 100-100 speed-wise? Um, so fiber is it's a piece of glass, right? Um, so you, it's basically your download speeds and your upload speeds are going to be the same no matter what. Um, Dave, what's that fire hose? Example you always give. Oh, so um, <laughs> it's a good, it's a good <laughs> one. Okay. There's a little difference in architecture uh, between a cable system and fiber system. So consider your neighborhood. I'm going to jump on this side so I don't block this person out from the pole back there. Um, consider your neighborhood. And if they were running a, a new water line, or I call it the fire hose, down the street. If you're the first one to tap off of it, you got plenty of water for your showers and your garden and everything, right? But what happens as your neighbors start tapping off, off that fire hose? What happens is the water pressure starts to go down. And this is exactly what happens in design um, from a cable provider. It's called a linear bus, if you want to brag to your friends about the technology you were to learn today. And this linear bus is exactly that. It's a piece of cable that goes down the street and everybody taps off of it. So some of you may notice that on weekends or on Christmas break or even after four o'clock that your speeds start to slow down and your TV may flicker, etc. So now let's jump to the fire hose under fiber. They are called private networks, direct connects. So instead of running that one big one with the taps off of it, everybody gets a fire hose into their house, comes down the street, and they all come back to a centralized water tower. So everybody is getting two million gallons of water, but as it comes through your hose, that 10 to 20 gallons for your house is not shared with anyone. And if you want to have 50 to 100 gallons, you can buy a bigger package, right? So no one else is on that fiber. Nobody else is using that hose. You always get the same performance. And, and that's a big thing because it's not just putting the fiber in the ground. It's designing the network. Anybody can say, we're going to start rolling out fiber. All right, cable providers can say, we're going to start rolling out fiber. Well, the design, the engineering, the strategic plan is very different than for cable. And I always like the analogy, I go to a gentleman down the street, I've been going there 20 years and he's been selling cars. The guy on the other side of the street is where I bought my boat, but after 20 years, he decides I like want to sell cars instead of boats. So my car comes due. Now where am I gonna go to buy my car? Well, I'm gonna go to the guy who's been doing it for 20 years. And that's what we're seeing in the U.S. when the cable providers all of a sudden say, well, we're going to do fiber too. You know, there's 250 municipal networks like Medina County, and you're going to see the cable providers will be saying we're going to be doing fiber too. But how are they really going to be doing it? It's not the same. Are they going to still use one big fire hose and tap off of it? That's not true fiber services. That's using fiber as your median, but that's not a true fiber design. So when you're ready to buy your next car, are you going to want to go to the iFibers who have been in the business 20 years doing nothing but residential fiber? Or are you going to want to go to the person who used to sell boats and decided to get into the car business? It makes a real big difference and it will on your performance and you need to keep that in mind when all these networks are going to start hitting these areas now that we've announced fiber as to exactly how that network's going to be set up. What do you buy? Okay. Thanks, Dave. Mm -hmm. um, this, um, this is pretty much the last slide, but these are some of the different partners. Um, Network is a massive undertaking of a project. We know that we can't do everything um, to to make it happen. Um, so these are just some of the partners that we use. Um, Vetro, they are basically <coughs> our design plat. Like they're kind of like they own all the data, basically. Uh, they house all the data for us. Don City will be your telehealth provider. 
Um, so, you know, instead of having to go to a hospital maybe that's 40 miles away from you, um, if it's just regular, you know, you think maybe you have strep or something, the doctor can kind of look at you um, straight through a private connection all the way to your home from the hospital. It's pretty cool stuff. Um, iFiber, um, they're the um, internet TV uh, voice provider that'll be first on the network. They're also um, entertaining the fact that are uh, entertaining the idea of bringing um, smart uh, home applications um, with them to this this uh, network. Um, they've been, like Dave said, they've been doing this for 20 years. Uh, all fiber, um, all residential fiber, all open application networks. They don't own a piece of infrastructure themselves, um, so they basically are just um, paying a toll to ride across other people's networks. Um, and they're out of Washington State. Um, they were here at the kickoff back in April, if any uh, of you were there. Um, uh, really great guys, um, their services, um, they're, they're known for their customer service. So um, obviously Medina County Fiber Network, thanks Dave. Um, so we'll be basically leasing from him. So we're leasing from Dave, and then our providers on our network will be leasing from us. Um, that's kind of how it all works. Nokia, you guys probably know that name. They're basically the electronics that sit on the ends of, the, of that fiberglass. Um, there'll be probably some of their electronics in your home. Um, and then uh, Foresight Group is our uh, engineering firm. Um, actually, this is the company that Ben and my, myself came from uh, before we started Lit Communities. Um, they've been out here as well. Um, they actually have an office uh, just across um, on the uh, town square here. And then uh, Continental Mapping, we do a lot of um, big GIS uh, kind of data collection um, when we're going through. <coughs> the network's only going to be built as good as your, your data that you get when you put it in there. Uh, and then Corning is um, one of the fiber manufacturers. So um, that's pretty much the one story. Yeah. Before I, I, let me interrupt you. No. I, I love this slide because <clears throat> this, is, this is the difference between the community network and the commercial network. So think about <clears throat> if you have an ailment, the process you go through, you go perhaps and see your general practitioner first, because general practitioners are good diagnosticians. But then they may send you to an internist who handles more areas in the body of a specific nature. God forbid, if it's bad enough you have to go to surgery, well before that, You'll go and maybe have some x-rays done or a CAT scan. So then you have a doctor who specializes in that that reads that. And then, God forbid, if you have to go to surgery, you want the person who has the steady hand and knows where to cut, right? And then there are a whole host of other people um, in your rehabilitation, etc. If you were going just with a commercial carrier, that carrier would be doing everything. If they were a hospital, it would be the same person or just a few people doing all of that. You would not have the best in each core competency working on you. The municipal network says, you know what, let's pull this apart and let's bring in continental mapping to go out and find exactly where we should put the fiber and let's document that for the community because that's the best of what they do. Let's see how much is on those poles and where do we have to go underground and you know where where don't we and let's go and talk to nokia one of the world leaders in fiber technology equipment that's all they do they build the circuit boards put the equipment together how to keep those water lines constantly getting you the pressure you want and let's talk to a carrier that already has a railroad in place that's been doing that and only doing transport for the last six six to ten years and then on, on top of that let's talk to the internist the person that's mapping out your body where these issues are they map out where everything is down to the last piece of fiber so we're able to respond quicker than that generalist working at the commercial carrier and then laying on top of that the eye fibers that's your surgeon. That's the one who is bringing in the services that you're going to see that performance. That's going to clear up your issues when the kids come home from school. They're the ones that are going to open you up and close you up and take out the problems you had. All right. This 
slide is the, the crux of the community network because it's exactly what it is. It's taking all the different entities that are the best at what they do and bringing those into the community rather than having a company who is doing something very different come in and now say they're going to jump in and they bring the same crew that has not done any of this right so that that's that's the big piece of the lit communities there's a financial side to it but the piece of being the aggregator to bring all these together that's what you're getting you're getting the best in the industry for that okay I didn't want to pass that up because even though it just has a bunch of names on it it really does talk to the architecture without having to get into all the gooey terms that put you to sleep at night you know we'll just keep it with that, that Bef one technology before we do questions I did want to um, talk about one thing that we haven't talked about yet when we do get going um, iFiber is eventually going to have, and I'm very low tech, so I'm actually very excited about this. They're going to set up these mini stores where just like you shop for any other product, like just like you go to the Apple store to shop for a phone, um, or you go to Best Buy to shop for a TV, you will be able to go to one of these little mini stores that are gonna pop up across Medina County, and you will be able to look at this package for your TV, and look at this package for your voice services and your internet, and you'll be able to actually physically shop at an actual um, location where you know you can ask questions. You're not on the phone with someone for a long, long time, and and not um, you know not getting the service that maybe you can get as you would one on one with a person uh, physically um, at a store together. So I, I, I'm actually really excited about marketing that part of it because I, I think it's a uh, you know sometimes it's just really really hard to decide on a phone which you, product you want versus visually seeing them and being able to ask questions as you're visually seeing the products. Yeah, and they'll have a physical pre presence uh, within the, the city, the county. Um, so if you do, you know, have any problems with, um, or just questions, or just want to see what they offer versus somebody else, like you'll be able to go in and then see all that firsthand, just like she was saying. Even after, um, you know, that that's a marketing kind of uh, tool that they use, um, which is it's wonderful. Um, they bring it to every community that they're in, um, and then they'll eventually show, set up a permanent shop um, within the county. So. We have our spot all set already at the county right. fair. Right. So come see us this summer. Do you guys have any questions? Yes, yes I have some questions. All right. Okay. Uh, one, uh, I got a little piggyback couple questions together. Okay. Uh, I'm curious as to why you're not concentrating, for instance, on the city of Medina first, where you get more bang for your buck or for your per mile fiber option sure. because you have a higher concentration sure. of people as opposed to these outlying areas. And the next one, when do we expect to be into the residential areas of the city of Medina? That's a good question. And, uh, and uh, another one, uh, I know you brought up you know, some, some pricing here. Uh, would we also expect that the local and county governments start piggybacking taxes on those uh, fees also uh, as a way of revenue. Would, we are not. Yeah, we're we're not allowed to yeah. impose fees. Only fees for utilities such as this can only be posed at the state level. The county does not. You know, even have the authority to. What about the city? The city. Well, do you guys have the authority to? Your your charter. Well, city would be only if it was cable, but with this being put over fiber, that's considered internet, and those aren't. That's not regulated at all at this point. Okay, right. Yeah. Okay, now back to the back to my timeline question. Mm -hmm. But yeah, back to the very first question of why we're going kind of the southern portion of right. the county first. Um, we realized that was the the area that needed it, like physically needed it the most, the the, the least amount of options, um, and then also some of the uh, mayors down there have been. Um, just very much a, a spokesperson for this project. Um, Mayor Carter in Seville to name one. Um, they're basically, they, uh, they own their own electric utility as well, which is something that's huge for us um, because that allows us to get on their poles uh, very easily. They're basically waiving, uh, waiving the fees for us to, to gain access to their poles. Um, so basically, you know, the, a mix of kind of the need for it, um, where we saw the need for it the most, 
uh, mixed in with the political will um, champions that we had down there. And, and let me add, we are looking to come to Medina absolutely as quickly yes. as construction allows us to get well, here. What, is, what does that mean time wise? This Probably year, next year, 18 five, 24 to 24 months? 18 to 24, How far? 18 to 24 months. So let me, uh, let's take a step into the world of equity and senior debt. Let's do a little, do a little financials, put our, put our hats on, okay? So <clears throat> when we are in the market to raise money, to start this initiative as the communities, that's part of their job. You need to get into an area which is what we call a manageable pilot. And we call it phase one is what we like to call it. And that means you need to find an area where the service is extremely bad. The infrastructure is inexpensive to build the network and you have a number of residents that will give us what's called a high take rate. That means how many homes sign up. Those are the three things because what you need is when you go then out of phase one to the bigger places like City of Medina, Medina Township, Montville Township, where as you said, you would normally believe that you would want to go into, you have to have a much bigger bucket of money to do that. Um, so, as Lauren mentioned, Seville, <coughs> we wanted to go from Lodi to Wadsworth. Why? Lodi, Wadsworth, and Seville all own their own telephone poles. There's something called make ready, which means that when you want to attach your fiber to a telephone pole, the owner of the telephone pole, and I've seen this happen because I was part of the build team for the network here, can charge up to $20,000 to attach to one pole. The, for the Medina County Fiber Network, it was two and a half million dollars just to touch 3,500 poles. $1,400 per pole. It's $20,000 to swap out a pole to go to the next one. It's very expensive. Railroads beat it though. It's 40,000 across the railroad. Um, what does it all cost? I did correct, we tried to, so I digress. So, because those three geographies had the ability to allow us to go on the pole and let us put our own fiber on. That's another thing. When you do this, what they call make ready, where you move everybody up and down on the pole to make room for the last person, and you have to keep certain spacing between power and phone and telecom. That, depending on who owns the pole, like Ohio Edison owns the pole, they don't allow the carrier to do that. You pay them a lot of money to do that. So what happens then in your phase one or your pilot is that the net income that's being thrown off to attract the big pots, the big investors, looks rather measly. And they're like, well, the payback, it really isn't there <clears throat> because you haven't been able to prove this to me. So you start off with what we call senior debt. Go to a bank, you keep the equity to the communities. The senior debt is used like a bank loan and what you do is you find the least expensive way without you know stressing quality it's not to you don't do it cheap you find the least expensive way that meets the specifications of the quality that you will be putting into the network and you build that phase you show how successful it is then you move on to where the areas are going to require a lot more money you know, when we moved, say, to Montville or City, City of Medina is a great example. These are all Ohio Edison poles. or some frontier poles in there, too. But uh, those Ohio Edison poles to do make ready, we're most probably going to have to go underground. And underground is roughly um, three to one as far as cost compared to going on a pole. So we would need a big bucket of money in order to do that first phase to attract all the other investors to do the rest of the county. So that was the real big piece. Now, unfortunately, um, Lodi still has some reservations and so does Wadsworth. So in order to move quicker to you, we've cut down and said, you know what, we're gonna deal with those reservations later. We're gonna cut it down to Village of Westfield Center, Seville and Guilford Township, and we're gonna move north quicker. So. We're not going to keep 
working out those issues. We'll come back to those. So actually it worked in our favor because we believe that it's going to be well received. We've done a kickoff down there with no less than 80, 85 people were at the kickoff. People were bringing busloads um, from, you know, assisted living centers, any, anything you could think of. They came by and they wanted to know about it. And this quick installation allowing us to install on the poles. Uh, we have blanket permits down there where we show them the designs one time and then our crews go out. We have blanket right-of-ways and the utility right-of-ways. Um, so we've been working with them to get this in quick so we could move on, but we need that quick win to get more than money back in. Yeah, I would have loved to have had five, six crews that start in Medina, one in Montville, some in the South. Unfortunately, the financing models <coughs> do not allow that unless, you know, you're like a Bill Gates and you're gonna, you're gonna sell, sell funds. Anybody know one of them? <laughs> Anybody have friends? Who are going to come as absolutely John's as quick as we close. can? Yeah, just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would I encourage the, the survey as, as much as I can say it, medinafiber.com, just because that will tell us to come here directly next. So, I, I, when you talked about like um, the city and the dark fibers and sure, um, and then so you're either going to put it on the poles or underground. And so, what does that involve? Does that involve tearing up everybody's yards, or what's involved with that? And then once you do that, once you have your hand in it and you lay the foundation, are you guys done? And then the city of Medina owns the technology and then leases it out. And that's how the money comes back. So yeah, we'll we'll continue ownership um, until uh, at some point, if the city of Medina wants to bond it, uh, they see a, that as a solid revenue source for their city. Um, they yeah, uh, these zeros. We'll be in the right of way. Yeah. So yeah, to answer your question about the tearing up of the environment, um, if you've ever seen a sprinkler system go in, they make a hole at one end of your lawn and it bores underneath and comes up at the other end, so you just have two little holes. That's the same way you put fiber in. There are machines that lay the conduit with the fiber <coughs> that can bore, you know, 800, 1,000 feet. It's in the utility right away, where your power is and everything else. The only time that it changes a little bit is when it goes from the sidewalk into your home. We will try to use the path which is used today. So if you have overhead into your home, we will stay with that. Um, if you have underground into your home, we'll you know ask you where the utility trench is and go just to the side of that. But um, but all of it is is boring. There's also micro trenching where uh, we could actually place the fiber just underneath. If there's a curb, and then put down a sealant against the asphalt. It's about that that wide of a slit in the road um, yeah. where the concrete and the asphalt kind of meet um, and then they backfill it. So that, that one's probably the least yeah. messy. Yeah, and that's and that salt, that uh, material that goes in there is made for our type of climates, cold weather, etc. People always say, you know, is it going to crack, what have you. It's an elastomer that gives. So there are these techniques which keeps anything to a minimum. And of course, we will be tearing up your head. Yeah. And, and well, I was part of the North Huntington project. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, and hopefully this is better than the concrete they used. You know, we we ask for support from the city on, um, you know, traffic control. Because so when we are going to be building down a street, we'd ask maybe for support from the city on uh, off-duty cops instead of us having to, you know, submit, like, traffic control plans. Just have a, a cop on either end shutting it down just for overnight however long it's going to take to, to build that one little section. We'd be very upfront with you, um, you know, emails, letters, uh, door hangers on, hey, we're going to be in this part of your uh, neighborhood from this uh, hour to this hour. Um, you know, we'd be very upfront with you. And at what point does Medina start getting this back into the community? The revenue? Um, at any point that they determine that they want to bond it and they want to own it themselves. And then, then you we would basically be out of it? Yeah, exactly. We'd, they would 
basically buy it back from us. But that's only if the city would choose to do that as a revenue source. It's, it's, it, it's an option. It's not something that's forced on the city in any way, shape, or form. And I'm, these I'm partners kind of would stay. I'm, I'm still kind of confused where the money's coming from because I, I understand what you're saying. So, so it's not so the taxpayers. So Lit Communities is providing the funding to build the last mile portion. We will connect to the Medina County Fiber Network as our uh, backbone ring, essentially. Um, and then we will own the last mile piece that goes from the county owned fiber to your residents and, and businesses. Um, if the individual communities decide down the road that they would like to uh, purchase that asset back, um, once you know its value as a re revenue generator has been proven, um, then you know we can assist with a, a bonding type situation. Um, it's important for us, I think, to stress, though, that um, despite the fact that we will be owning this um, network asset, we consider it to be a community network. Um, we've been driven from the beginning um, by, you know, our experience in the industry and, and seeing how, you know, the question was asked, well, why start in this low population area? You know, a big part of that is sort of philosophically motivated, um, you know. AT&T, Comcast, CenturyLink, those companies go to the low-hanging fruit. Um, we've seen also the, the pitfalls, the flip side of that, um, a company like Google Fiber trying to go into a big city um, without taking into consideration the costs for make ready, um, without taking into consideration the relationship with the community. Um, and you know, Lauren spoke to that a little bit. Another reason that we're starting in the South is because you know, we know that we're not going to be fighting a battle with the municipal leadership when it comes <coughs> to full attachment agreements, when it comes to permitting and, and those sorts of things. Uh, it, the, you know, the, these, these projects are incredibly complex and difficult <coughs> to orchestrate, and so having, doing it in a place where the community partner is a willing participant makes the whole thing go s much more smoothly. Um, and then, one other thing to uh, mention to your question about your yard being torn up. This isn't finalized, um, but we are exploring an option um, with a Spanish company um, that has started to do some work here in, in Washington State, so that their product is proven in the States. But they place uh, essentially a, a, a micro duct within existing water pipes, um, and then they, they run the fiber through that. Um, so an option that we're exploring to do uh, as a pilot if the um, water authority and the residents of the community are willing is to do the drops. Uh, and when I say drop, that's the fiber that goes from the curb into your home um, through the water utility pipe that's already coming into your house. So that means zero damage to your yard. Um, you just you know make an incision in the pipe, insert a valve, and then another one on the other also end. Also zero damage to your water pipes. Also <laughs> zero damage to your <laughs> water pipes. So, and and as, as that um, option crystallizes, um, we will have a live demo that people can see um, so that when the time comes for you to schedule a drop installation to your house, if that's an option that you'd like to pursue, we will try and make that available to you. That's right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. I've got a couple questions, and I guess I'm going to address this to Dave because we're going to go back to your your uh, water hose, fire hose analogy. Um, if I understand you correctly, uh, right now I have uh, Armstrong with the lowest internet speed they can get for senior citizens or fixed income, uh, and even I mean, we'll just say I'm getting X megabytes per second because I don't know what it is exactly, but at any given time, due to their infrastructure and equipment. I may not necessarily be getting that. It may be lower. Okay. And of course, as you say, when more people are going on it, because I can see, tell you, when I watch TV at night, I have Roku and Direct TV now. And every now and then, mm -hmm. picture those appear. I get the little spinning wheel. Right. Um, so if I get the uh, say the 100 100 option, I will be getting 100 megabytes. Yeah, your your speed, your, night. your speed test might say 99.2. Something like yeah, that. It'll be plus or minus 10 yeah. instead of 50, which is uh, what you're getting. My, the next two questions are kind of interrelated. I live in an apartment complex. Okay. Uh, all, the house, all the apartments are wired. 
uh, for Armstrong. Not everybody has uh, Armstrong. Uh, some have uh, direct TV satellite dish. Uh, some just don't have anything. They have a little high definition antenna for TV. Terrestrial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so we may not get 100% participation you know, in doing your survey. So if only right. three or four people out of 196 apartments <coughs> yeah, sign so up right we're, we're, we're going to catch these guys last. One, one way we were trying to mitigate um, people that are, are having trouble accessing the survey mm -hmm. um, is, you know, the, the place at the county, the county fair um, will have, you know, uh, options where you can do sit there and do the survey right there, mm -hmm. sign on paper, say you want the service. You know, there's, there's other options they, that we're they, trying to They won't do the survey, well, they won't go to the fair. So well, trust me, I know really my neighbors. Here's <laughs> a couple of <laughs> options that, that we would consider in a situation like yours. Um, First of all, doing some type of event. Uh, I, I don't know how large your apartment community is, but if it's, if it's significant. There's 96 apartments. Sure, if so. If you're doing an event, you're not going to get more than 15 yeah. to 20 people. Because we've, we've been down that road before. We've, we've been down that road. Okay. It's so you don't do an right. event, you know, they, a lot of them. Well, so here, here's, here's sort of the, the other side of that event coin, and part of our process for driving signups is to recruit someone who lives locally in that community, call them a, a champion or an advocate or whatever. It seems like perhaps you might be a good candidate. Well, I'm all for it because uh, <laughs> sign up? Uh, I'm currently paying uh, more for less. Yeah, I, mean, I am too. I live in Denver in a, in, a, in, you know, in a dense urban market and I pay $75 um, for, yeah, you know. 65 Right. Yeah. So this is 100 megabytes for 50 bucks. It's a good deal. So um, I'm, I'm there. Are well, there are there a lot of homes around your apartment building? Are you in a residential area? I'm really in a residential area. We live uh, off of Harding's, I'm sorry, Highland Drive. Okay. Down by uh, okay. Walgreens. So the consideration yeah. of building to your neighborhood is mm -hmm. not how many people inside your building necessarily oh, will be signing yeah. up, but it will be how many people in that geography. So unless your apartment complex is in the middle of a cornfield all by itself, okay. it won't necessarily hurt you if only four or five percent, okay. where 80 percent of the homes around you sign up. Okay. That's always the biggest question is, how do I know if this has come to my house? Yes, I'll be perfectly honest, be perfectly honest with you, you know, the areas to the northwest section of the, of the county where there are certain mandates that you can't have a lot size smaller than seven acres mm -hmm. does pose a challenge. And we are already looking into high speed wireless mm -hmm. and those type of uh, technologies that are used in very low dense areas. But you have need to look at the aggregate mm -hmm. um, for basically how many homes per mile? So okay. we will count your apartment complex as one home. Mm -hmm. And if we can get 10 out of there, it's like hitting 10 homes. Okay. Okay? But well, let me clarify one thing real quick. They're not going to come out of your apartment complex unless the landlord allows them to come out. I understand. So you will not get any service. Yeah. That's yeah. landlord. A lot of times yeah. apartment Sorry. complexes are kind of so locked into contracts <laughs> with the current we're not. We're not. No, uh, that I can tell you because uh, yeah, we be uh, they were getting free uh, cable to one of the uh, to all party of rooms, okay. and uh, all yeah. one day the manager looked up and says, "Hey, the, the TV's not working." Let me just uh, say one thing: it is our goal to connect every single home and business within the Dining County. Okay. Um, if if your apartment complex for some reason you're the only two that sign up. We still want to bring fiber to that entire complex. Um, the service will eventually sell itself. We believe, um, you know, it, you'll start selling how good it is. Your neighbors will start t talking about how they want it. You know, it's this grassroots effort that everybody's like, "Oh, I've got this new iFiber service. That's great." You know, I'm never uh, losing connection. Uh, they're they're great customer service. If I have a question on how to hook up something, they they're right there. You know. Um, it, it's not our intent to pass up anybody. Um, like Dave was saying, we're, we're looking at, 
even wireless technologies to get to those very, very low dense areas within the county because we do want to include every single person. We don't want to be just another monopoly um, that kind of is, is picking and choosing areas. But one last answer to your question. We talked a little bit about, in, in the beginning of the presentation, kind of how we go through this two-step process, where first we do a survey to sort of get a high-level mm -hmm. picture of what the demand looks like, and then we do a sort of more detailed survey um, where people are actually signing up for service. During that process, so hand-in-hand -hand with that, we've done this um, design engineering effort to help us determine with a high level of accuracy what the cost to build will be. So once we have that cost to build, and we break this out on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis, we call them fiber hoods. And like Dave said, it's not necessarily the boundaries of the neighborhood that you might be used to. It might include apartment buildings and, and whatever. It's more has to do, geographically speaking, with how many homes can be served from the cabinets that we're going to be using to run the, the wires out to people's homes. So what, what, so, let me just, let me just finish. So, You'll be able to see, when you enter your address, you'll be able to see how close your fiber hood is to reaching the number of signups that are necessary to um, justify the cost of construction in that area. Okay, let me ask you this. Uh, is there a, a paper version of this survey available? Because if I get copies of it, we'll distribute it. We can make that we happen. We can make that happen, yeah. Easily. Uh, it's not right now. But okay. yeah, we could easily make that happen. I'd come back and collect them from you when you got them all filled out. <laughs> well, we'll yeah. distribute them, getting them back. That could be another, another story. thing. But, Understood. You know, it's not that we haven't tried. It's sure. a 55 and older neighborhood. Yeah. And a lot of the people, they say, why do you want to have a Facebook page for the association? Because none of us know how to get on it. Yeah. So we can talk about you. <laughs> but you know, it's 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 kind of an the older sure. generation. Yeah. Are, we are getting some younger people. We are getting yeah. younger people and sorry. That's okay. I, I just yeah. set up a camera and a Skype session for a seventy five year old lady in my church. And she just loves seeing her grandchildren now be nice. Yeah. So there's always something that and everybody has internet, not everybody, everybody wants internet. Right, but there are, there's always something that will attract someone to the service. They just need to know about it. Yeah. And like I say, we'd be happy to, to uh, distribute your survey. No, no, no. Okay. You'd be happy. Well, whatever. <laughs> Does city council have any questions? That'd be great. Yeah, more questions because I, Paul was going to get the big hook out. You know, one. Well, that's just hour, I, I, so Is it okay if we go a little over? I want to. Uh, yeah, a little bit. I have five questions. Okay, five you questions. have some questions. Uh, okay, I maybe ours. I do have one question that hasn't been asked yet, and that's where is this model working now? Uh, the open access model? Right. Um, so open application, thank you. Um, so Lauren mentioned the entire country of Sweden. That's obviously not directly applicable to communities here in the United States. Um, there are several in Washington State. Um, iFiber, our first internet service provider, um, has been solely doing business in an open access, open application environment here in the U.S. Um, you, the, the state of Utah has an extensive open application uh, network known as Utopia. Um, you may have heard of it. it. It got a lot of bad press early on because um, they did not utilize this type of approach that we're doing in our, in our build where we include the demand um, and, and you know only build in places where the demand has justified the investment. Um, so Utopia run into some problems, but they are now quite yeah, successful. The, those, so two those two providers on the bottom, on the bottom X they, Mission and Beehive, are both in located uh, on that Utopia network, and they have I bet I think uh, like twelve, or yeah, so. thirty-seven total carriers, that's residential right. and commercial. Now we're not going to go that crazy, yeah. no. and that's for the entire state of. Utah. So they have some over here, some over here. We're talking about the county. So, you know, the 13 we have, we have just about everybody in commercial side. Three to four in residential will be just fine. Then John, I cannot small. wait to hear your five questions. There's, there's <laughs> small town examples too. There's a town in Idaho called Ammon that's been very successful with this model. 
Um, you say small town, approximately how many people? Oh, God, I, I think know. they have like 7,000 people. So yeah. it's a, okay, yeah, so yeah, small yeah. enough. So okay. and, and it's, you know, the, the, the whole concept of, of this open, up, open application model is that it's very consumer friendly. So when the consumer has choices between service providers, um, you, you see uh, lower prices and you see better customer service. Um, and, and that there's strong data to support those claims from these existing networks. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'll let. The question I have is you have a monthly fee you charge. Now that monthly fee, I don't know, I don't know if these, these are different ones, iFiber and that, but let's say it's $50. So I pay you fifty dollars, and I say, okay, now I want internet, or I want phone, or I want something. So do I pay another fee to another provider that's on your network to get that service? So you'll purchase those services sort of a la carte on right. The so the fee is not going to be sixty bucks. It could be it'll be hundred. It'll be prorated based on how long you. Ask no, no, it's no. No. no, counselor. It, let him answer the question. Yeah. It, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> no, it is. It's for the hundred by hundred, which will be more than sufficient for many of you. It's fifty dollars. A phone line is fifteen dollars, and as far as the television goes. There's many there packages. There are so many packages, I'm not even going to go through it because... And that's why I said go to the retail store and you'll say, I want this, I want this, I want this, or you might have a budget that you want to stay under and Well, that's what I want to pay. clarify. I don't yeah. want to have people think that they're just paying this fee and they get it all. No, no, no. no, no, no. no. They, don't, they don't get it all. It's an a la carte right. deal. Okay. Okay. And if you're unhappy, like let's say you purchased the 100, 100 from iFiber and you have an unpleasant customer service experience where someone's very rude to you on the phone. Well, you can go back to your computer and switch to the 100 service from Beehive in this example um, and, and be automatically provisioned via software. <coughs> You'll notice seconds. like no downtime essentially. Right. So, and, and in that case, your rate, if, if you're switching providers mid-month, the rate that you pay to that first provider that you've discontinued service from would be so basically, all the service providers, not just the internet providers, the telehealth providers, the TV providers, they'll pay us a fee um, into this, basically it's like a back-end page for this lit marketplace. All their services will be listed, the customer will pay the provider through this portal. So basically it's all, it's all one bill um, and we're just getting paid from the providers and you're paying, the customers are paying the providers. So it's all just kind of a swim lane of, of money. Um, right, from the user experience perspective, they don't need to know anything about what communities really, the, the you know, they, they, they pay their service provider, their service provider pays us. I mean, it's like kind of Armstrong now where you get the basic channel, you can buy up to mm -hmm. get right. HD, so it depends how much yeah, you want to spend. Build, this is the same kind of deal, you can just build your own yeah, package. Just, and you and build so your own package. Right. You don't have to go from 128 to 200 just channels. Just to get the phone. So you get the phone for the discount. You know, right so right you right get right. 90 channels you don't even watch. Yeah, right. You can buy just ESPN. Yeah. You can get Direct TV now from AT and T, which is 35 or 38 channels. So you can everything from the content side, the television side, if you want to call it, is broken down much less. Because I think if you really go and look at your viewing habits, you're going to find. Majority of time you're watching between five and seven channels, except for specialty like ESPN or basketball if you're a basketball fan, etc. But basically, it's five to seven channels. Now the next question is when you, when you figure out and get everybody ready to sign up, what's the initial term of the initial contract? There are no contracts. Or you got to sign up because you you got to have money to build the network, so you want people to sign up. So if I sign up and then a month later say I'm out. I assume there's a termination fee then or something because you're counting on me to pay you to put well, in the infrastructure. We are counting on the service provider to pay us to build but if I, if I so how our financing is based on the contracts that we have with the service provider. The service providers know that in order to keep your business, again, a lot different than a commercial network, they are going to have to constantly perform and that's why there's going to be multiple ones. Is there an exposure when you only have one? like say the first year or two, yes. But they know that they are taking that risk. And, and they're the willing to do them. it, and the risk is on them, but they are that good. And iFiber's got about eight counties in the state of Washington and growing. 
they know that their retention in the 98, 99 percent time. So you won't have to sign some 24 month. Well, contract. I was wondering because they, right. they're counting on my money to put install because right. installation is a huge cost. It, right. it is. So, 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 that, so they, mm -hmm. they are so confident in their ability to deliver a high quality product and service that they're willing to take that financial risk. They're basically taking that risk from the customer. Right. And, yeah, and, I don't know and, what it is. And they're now. taking it from us. But to yeah. answer the council president's question, there is no termination. Correct. No termination. If he no decides cable. after a month he doesn't want it anymore, he that's walks just, away. That's right. It. And that's yeah, if you want to go back that's to like your cable connection. Okay. Okay. Your I just want to be. I just want to be there. So yeah, I mean that's kind of important for people. I right. Imagine. But right. there is a connection fee. So if that, you go, you, you go to it, and then you drop off, and then you come back to it. You pay that connection fee twice, right? We we are um, looking at first of all to sign up when the fiber is being built through your neighborhood. There will not be a connection fee. If we have to come back after we were building, then okay. there'll be like a minimum fee, twenty, thirty dollars. Oh yeah, we want to come down a street and have no connection fee. If there's twenty homes and nineteen mm -hmm. sign up, those nineteen are not going to get a connection fee in the first run, okay. which is awesome. That's Sorry, that's, that, I know that's confusing. Okay. That's just a yeah. try to example. This is an example, see but potentially, if other providers yeah. were to come onto the network after 18 months or so. But I don't know what uh, Armstrong does right now. I don't know if they charge a termination fee because I know sometimes it's difficult to terminate. No. No. They no. Don't. Okay. They don't. The, the, the last question, what, how are you guys going to handle, which is happening now, we just had a few in come to the city, the 5G poles are going in because the state law allows everybody to put them in their front yard now. So yeah. how... You mean handle... Well, I mean, that's going to be another c competitor, right? Sure. Well, okay. So here, here's the thing about 5G that a lot of people don't realize. So current 4G wireless antennas cover a roughly 10 square mile radius. So, and also important for this conversation, each of those antennas, even the 4G ones of today, are backhauled by a fiber optic cable that takes that data to a data center. Um, so every 5G antenna is going to require a fiber optic backhaul. So what that means is, yes, you are right, the carriers have won the right to put their poles where basically wherever they want. That's a Polar whole other <laughs> argument. That I, I disagree with that very strongly, but it, you know that's that's another argument. Um, the the point of my answer here is that our network. You know, Dave talked about how the importance of engineering this from the ground up um, to be all that it can be. Um, part of that is uh, spare capacity built in to support future 5G sites should any carriers decide to um, place those here. So you, you, there's sort of a parallel happening in the 5G wireless world to what was happening five to ten years ago in the fiber to the home space where the big companies with a lot of money to invest in upgrading and building this type of infrastructure, they go to the low hanging fruit. We call them NFL cities in our in telecom world. You know? um, so, you know, Foresight Group, the company that we come from, is currently doing design engineering on behalf of Verizon in like San Francisco, Cleveland, which is actually how we met Dave in the first place, um, Knoxville, Knoxville, Nashville, Seattle, those types of places. Um, and essentially, it's going to be many, many years before these big companies get around to making the massive investment that will be necessary to place 5G in, in, a, in a community like Medina. So you have to think about, because of the shortness of the coverage, so 5G antenna covers about 500 square feet, you're going to have to have one of those antennas, you know, every corner. Well, just to let you know, we already got applications and they want to put them in now. Well, that, that, I mean, that's crazy because they have no way to get that data out once it's there. But that's my next question. Didn't Armstrong, the, the years ago, I think it was in the 90s when we were here, I think they made an investment, Jim, you may have been around, it was $10 million when they put, and I thought they put fiber in because they said they could sell other lines. So I would assume if Armstrong has fiber, but they're probably not selling it to anybody else or leasing it out. I, I would assume that's where we, the fiber We have be. Armstrong fiber. Yeah, We've got Medina yeah. County fiber and Armstrong yeah. fiber into so, this building. So yes, yes. for you redundancy. Make a, good, a good point. And but the mm -hmm. part of the issue is that um, I can I can I would be willing to bet good money that that fiber, uh, my own personal money, that that fiber uh, is not um, that there's not enough strands in there to support the number of antenna sites that would be required. Um, yeah. So we're not going to be competing with 5G 
we're gonna, enabling we're going to be working with them because this we're going to be putting in like an 800 count fiber you know it's like a bundle yeah. now the one thing though you need to understand is 5g like all wireless works like the big water fire hose that goes down your street all right you have a tower and everybody's going into that one tower which means, and you'll even see these in your contracts, right? Yeah, we've an unlimited plan, but when you go above 10 gig, you drop from 4G to 3G. Or it's based on usage. That's that single water hose thing. And 5G today came to go around corners. Or through wall. I mean, or through walls. Trees, like so everybody brings that up. Answer. And so again, you need to understand a, just a little. That's why they want the sticks in their yard, John, because it doesn't go around the corners. Why not? That's what we're about. Right. So 5G <laughs> is being designed for autonomous self driving cars, um, you know, those type of applications. When will it really be ready for personal use? Probably when it's like 9 or 10G. I mean, it's really not. And again, it will always be that single fire hose down your street because you can't do individual spectrums for every single person to that tower, which is the equivalency of fiber to the home. So there will be applications for it and we will be ready to get revenue onto the network to help expand it into areas throughout the county by leasing that fiber to the 5G carriers. Yeah, that dark fiber question you had earlier, that's exactly what we're talking about here. We're making it ready for other applications, not just that, um, you know, the internet phone TV, but this, that 5G application. We're putting a big enough cable in the ground, enough fiber in the ground, um, where the Verizons and the at ts of the world will basically, they're gonna realize that they don't need to start spending all this money to put their own fiber in the ground where they can just lease from. So the areas that are less used or guests in the city would you ever is your plan ever contracting with armstrong to use their dark fiber lines in certain areas so when we do our design engineering process um, we will leverage existing assets to the extent that we are able to um, it's you know so if armstrong wants to make their fiber available to us at a reasonable price absolutely um, you know and and the reverse of that too if if they want to utilize our fiber to deliver service they're more than welcome to um, well i see what's going to i mean if you guys come and i can see armstrong then offering the same speed you guys are offering because they have fiber so that's, well they do but they, do they don't necessarily have fiber to the home and they, right, so they, they just they just announced fiber to the home in certain geographies a couple weeks ago it's not just putting the fiber in but as lauren mentioned it's all the infrastructure equipment to be able to drive those speeds, electronics on the right? That that's that's the key, um, and what we call density and equipment to bring each person their own water hose. Mm -hmm. So again, not all fiber networks are designed the same. You've got to really know what you're buying. Just because it says it's fiber, it just means that they ran the strand, but they didn't design it the way a fiber an individual private fiber network should be designed. Right, and, th and that also plays into why we do a survey and why we go through a sign-up process. If there's a neighborhood that already has fiber to the home and the residents there are happy with it, then we're probably not going to invest in building there because we wouldn't get any customers. I believe they announced for the 100 by 100, um, our 49.99, there's a 79.99. I've read that in the paper. Yeah, you're not going to see a comparison. much better price um, and again, anywhere than that. Yeah, that pricing again is because these guys have been doing it for 20 years and they know how to design it to get the most out of it. Jim or Paul, do you have any questions? Uh, I had uh, one uh -huh. question to ask Jim. No, okay. okay, just two quick questions. One, um, as you go to split these into the homes, you mentioned cabinets. Any idea what those are going to look like size-wise? They're about this wide, about that tall, and they sit on a three by three foot concrete pad. They um, look very similar to the cabinets that you already see out there that are there for your cable. Our, TV. our goal is to try to hide them 
uh, as well as we can we're within not the community. This in front of anyone's front yard. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, going to be we're, behind we're, city halls. I'm yeah. sorry, behind fire stations. <laughs> <laughs> Things like that. Is, so, how many? Is there a certain number that each cabinet serves, as far as that goes? Yeah, we're looking at feeding um, up to about three thousand out okay. of one cabinet. Okay. Um, so. And then, uh, obviously, we're probably not going to have a fiber hood of three thousand people. Um, we'll splinter that down into more logical breakdowns. But. And then the second question, with, I guess, for lack of a better term, all the chefs that are in the kitchen in this process, uh -huh. when a problem arises. How are the customers or the residents able to get results? I mean, because you've got to troubleshoot where that problem lies. Right there. They have one call. Your carrier, yeah. your carrier that's providing you the phone, internet, and content, you call them. And that's how we work on a commercial network today. People say that to me, same thing. Well, AT&T is bringing my internet over Medina County Fiber. Who do I talk to? Blah, blah, blah. We have a process in place. You always call the carrier and our network operations center has been educated to work with all the carriers so they believe that it's a fiber issue, their network operational center calls ours and you don't get in the middle of it. And, and in terms of the customer experience, you never, as the customer calling your service provider, you're never aware of the fact that the problem may have been escalated up to the network operations partner or anybody else. It's just. Uh, internally, we have a set of processes set up to deal with those escalations, um, and, and again, we are building on, on the success of the experience of others that have run similar operations. We'll have a local maintenance uh, construction, like maintenance crew. Uh, so if, if someone like runs into a pole and knocks down the fiber, the, we'll see around. that instantly in our network operations oh, center. Deploy the crew. The crew. Like so. <laughs> There won't be having to send somebody from you know Cleveland or some other big city like they'll, they'll yep. be in. The other thing, market. this just one last piece. <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about technology. This network, the residential network, will have what's known as protect mode, which a lot of them don't, and I highly doubt anybody else in the area will. Medina County Fiber is one of the few that if you cut the backbone uh, anywhere along the 151 miles, the network stays up. It's designed with equipment and engineering that it has two paths in each direction. So if our fiber is cut, the network automatically reroutes itself. So lit communities, the iFibers, et cetera, will be utilizing residential fiber coming off of Medina County fiber that has this protect mode around the 150 miles going between each of the neighborhoods. So if there's a backbone break of us connecting, we're called the middle mile, connecting all these fiber hoods, our network will reroute the other way and keep everybody the customer up. won't even know that it's Okay, happened. So the backbone's completely protected. Um, it's one of the few networks actually in the area that does that. We redesigned ours about five years ago. Okay, that's, that's just Should another one? Worrying. <laughs> okay, all right, with, with that then, you've got, the, you've got the, the line coming down the street though. If something breaks near the first house, there's no redundancy there. Correct. Down the That's street. correct. It's on okay. the backbone, but it's just okay. not on the capillaries or streams yeah. coming. To, okay. to speak to that, though, we do try to build in a little bit of redundancy on certain parts of the last mile network. Not necessarily the piece that's going to be just going down your street and probably to your home, okay. but on the bigger, the larger um, streets within your community, we'll try to build in some, a little bit of redundancy on that last mile piece as well. Like around the outside of the neighborhood. Exactly. Right? It's feeding okay. it. Yeah, so they'll try to be as many of these multiple groups as possible. Yeah, and you sort of one last thing, you know, we're obviously intending to be a part of your community for a long time. If you think of questions that you didn't voice tonight and you want to reach out to us, we're an open book, I'm happy to answer anything. Any other from any other from the group? Any other questions at all? Anybody else? Everybody? We really thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, we really great. appreciate thank it. You. Appreciate thank you for coming. Thank, thank you guys you for, for coming. Thank, thank you, thank you to, the, to the residents for coming. Did we answer some of your so questions? All of your questions. Just so you understand. Okay. And, and again, right. if you think of other questions down the road, Dave here would be happy to answer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and because because you guys were here, you're the only ones that can, I can see complaining on, on the internet now. <laughs> Nobody else in all those groups can complain. Get on that Facebook page. Right? <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, we're done.